Our next speaker is Mark Dijkstra, and he will tell us about observational signatures of direct collapse black holes. Okay, um, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak and the Academy for this wonderful honor. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had to do that. Uh, so I'll be talking about observational signatures of direct collapse black holes, results that have been presented in the following two papers. Uh, highlighted Max Kronk, who is in the audience here. So uh, we've already heard about the direct collapse black hole scenario. Um, my remote is not working. I'm pressing next. Well, anyway, um, Volker already mentioned something about this in the, in the question. Um, a few years ago, or many, quite a few years ago, we were wondering what it takes to not have the direct collapse black hole formation scenario happen. And in particular, one of the questions we wanted to know was whether it was really realistic to suppress the formation of H2 in uh, pristine atomically cooling halos. Particularly because the radiation backgrounds that are required to suppress the formation of H2 are very high. Right, and we thought that the radiation, for example, the Lyman-Werner background is, con is likely much lower than what is required. And also because of the mean free path of Lyman-Werner photons, there will be very little fluctuations in this radiation background. However, if you, go, um, if you move very close to star-forming galaxies, you may actually get, um, you may actually get um, a sufficiently elevated Lyman-Werner flux such that you actually dissociate all the, that you actually meet, you meet this very intense radiation field, or you get to this very intense radiation field. So this is why, um, you know, we, uh, we were a bit disappointed at first that we couldn't rule out this model. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I, I trust it now. Um, we, um, at first we were disappointed that we couldn't rule out this model, but then we realized that if you, you know, if you actually have, um, <clears throat> if, you, if this can happen in close proximity to star-forming galaxies, you know, this may give you some, some interesting predictions. Now the diff difficulty, of course, of having uh, this effect happen close to a luminous star-forming galaxy is that these star-forming galaxies are likely to drive winds as well. So then it's not so clear whether gas will remain pristine. Um, <clears throat> So it turns out that if you want to look at how frequently you have this direct collapse happening, uh, it turns out it's actually quite rare. It depends on the intensity, the critical intensity of the radiation field that is needed to suppress H2 formation. It, turn, it depends on how the outflows from the star forming galaxies propagate. It depends also on the escape fraction of ionizing and Lyman-Werner photons. So if you want to quantify um, for example, make predictions for the number density of direct collapse uh, black hole sites as a function of redshift. Um, I think this plot actually nicely summarizes that it's just very uncertain, right? And I'm not going through the details of all these models, but these different, uh, different colored symbols represent models with different required critical radiation intensities for this effect to happen. It has different prescriptions for winds. These are all semi-analytic models. It also has... Um, the blue points here actually have a non-unity non Lyman-Werner escape fraction. Now this effect here is exaggerated because we assume a single value for the escape fraction of Lyman-Werner photons. If there's a distribution, the effect will be a bit different. But in any case, this plot shows that this is also a very important parameter in, in this study. Right, so if you look at this, there is orders of magnitude uncertainty in the predicted number of direct collapse black holes at, re at, at most redshifts, and I think most people that work in this field agree on this. So it will be interesting to look at observational signatures, and we've already heard about this in the past two talks. Um, what I'll be focusing on are two signatures that we've, heard, uh, we've worked on. The first one is Lyman Alpha, and the reason Lyman Alpha is interesting is that if you have a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole accreting, uh, accreting gas, and it's uh, surrounded by this optically thick uh, envelope of a pristine atomic hydrogen gas, then a lot of the high energy photons will be efficiently converted into Lyman Alpha. So a substantial fraction of the bolometric luminosity of the accretion black hole will come out in Lyman Alpha. So just to give you a couple of numbers for 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, this number comes out to about 10 to the 43 ergs per second, which is on the luminous side of Lyman Alpha emitters. Right? And also what is, to me was very interesting about this, about this process is that the Lyman alpha radiative transfer is very simplified compared to what we are used to when we're modeling low redshift galaxies. There's no star formation, no stellar feedback, no dust, um, pristine environment, suppressed fragmentation. All of this makes Lyman alpha radiative transfer easier to do. And the subtle thing is that the suppressed molecular hydrogen content also 
um, helps because it's not only dust that can kill limon alpha, molecular hydrogen can also kill limon alpha, prevent limon alpha from escaping. But again, for the, for the direct collapse black hole scenario, this is the molecular hydrogen is very much suppressed. So there's two. So I think this is why, uh, in the past few years, we've seen, or oh, in the past year actually, <clears throat> we've seen quite some interesting theoretical works on predicting Lyman alpha signatures from direct collapse black holes. I'm not going through the details. This is just like just show, flashing some results from recent papers. This is from Smith et al., um, who performed Lyman alpha radiative transfer on snapshots in cosmological hydrodynamical simulations of a forming direct collapse black hole. Uh, Smith et al. looked at radiation pressure of the Lyman alpha. Now, Lyman alpha radiation pressure is something that has not st been studied much at all, mostly for computational reasons. But what is interesting about direct collapse, again, because Lyman alpha is produced efficiently, it's trapped very efficiently, the environment where you expect direct collapse to happen is extremely um, well prone to Lyman alpha radiation being trapped and building up pressure, and the Lyman alpha radiation may actually become dynamically important. So if anywhere in the universe Lyman alpha radiation pressure is important, it's in these kind of environments. So I think this is something that we'll see much, well, hopefully see more of in the future. And what we've looked at is looking at simplified representations of uh, collapsing clouds with different geometries, orientations, etc., and look at the emerging spectra. We'll not go into the details. What I will talk about in a bit more detail is the curious case of CR7. So I've heard, I know that people have talked about this a little bit at this conference already. So this galaxy is interesting because it has been proposed to be a candidate direct collapse black hole. And just let me summarize why that was. Uh, it was extreme, extraordinarily bright in Lyman alpha. 10 to the 44 ergs per second is as bright as it gets for Lyman alpha emitters at any redshift. The equivalent width of the Lyman alpha line is very high. It's much higher than that of most Lyman alpha emitters. Helium 1640 line detection is rare. The helium 1640 line detection is actually quite significant. It uh, would imply a very hard illuminating source in the center of the source. Um, there's no meta lines associated with this galaxy. Now, I've, I, I am aware that there are some more recent studies by Rebecca Bowler and that suggest that there may be an oxygen line detection. For the remainder of the discussion, this actually doesn't affect my, my talk at all. Um, but I think one of the most interesting things about this is that CR7 has multiple components. You have this bluish um, young galaxy uh, associated with a nearby older, more massive galaxy. So that's exactly I guess, what Mike Norman was referring to, is that you have actually this, this massive galaxy close to a potential direct collapse black hole site. Right? Now, the interesting thing about CR7 is that its luminosity by itself requires the black hole to be great, more massive than what you expect for direct collapse black holes. Right? It should be in excess of about 10 to the 7 solar masses. And um, this is actually the interesting thing is that this is um, the requirement on the mass is consistent with theoretical modeling that have, has been done by people in the audience here, uh, Tillman Hartwig and Bhaskar Agarwal. So the idea is that, um, <clears throat> well, so if you want to explain the CR7, you basically formed the, 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 the black hole at much higher redshift. Then the galaxy as a whole evolved from high redshift down to redshift 7. So um, what you're seeing, you're seeing CR7 not as a direct collapse black hole, but already as a somewhat more matured black hole, which has actually which initially formed through direct collapse. Now, the interesting thing is that um, if that is really true, then the Lyman alpha radiative transfer becomes much more difficult, as I explained earlier. Right, then you do not have these pristine, perfect conditions which simplify the radiative transfer. Okay, so if you want to model, we wanted to see what kind of information is actually in the Lyman alpha line profile. And when we do this spectral line profile, there's very good data on this. And when you do this at lower redshifts, um, because of all these complications associated with stellar feedback, etc., you, you take a subgrid prescription. So. A very common subgrid prescription that people use is the so-called shell model. So you have a Lyman alpha source here, and there's a, just a spherical shell around it. A spherical shell has a number of parameters, column density of H1, outflow velocity, turbulent velocity, dispersion, dust content. Right? And it turns out that if you um, try to model the line of CR7, you start with a Lyman alpha line that is this uh, blue dotted line, which the redshift of which is determined by the, the helium 1640 line. So helium 1640 line sets the redshift of Lyman alpha, the unscattered Lyman alpha. Now the scattering through this outflowing shell reshapes re the line shape to come out like this. Right? So you can see this is actually a good fit to the data. Shell model parameters are listed here. 
I will not run through these parameters, but the main point I want to make is that these shell model parameters are very consistent with what we, um, what we need for low edge of Lyman alpha emitters and also green P galaxies. Right? So what this means is that CR7 likely has uh, quite an unusual source powering the nebular emission inside of it, but the Lyman alpha that is scattering out of the ISM of these galaxies seems to be scattering through a medium that is very reminiscent of what we see in lower edge of galaxies. Now, of course, that you know, sort of consistent with the picture that you require the galaxy hosting CR7 to have evolved since the, the black hole first formed. But I think this particular point that is actually so similar to what we see in lower edge of galaxies is something that I think um, uh, needs to be explored more. I think this is a very interesting additional constraint which is often overlooked. Now, in the final four and a half minutes, I'll look at my, I'll talk about my favorite, uh, my favorite signature of direct collapse. And this is, I think, uh, smoking gun signature, and I really mean smoking gun. If we see this, there's no doubt, really. Um, so, these are the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, ground state, first excited state. Lyman alpha connects 1s to 2p. Now, we know that spin orbit coupling actually splits the 2p level up into these two different levels 2p3 half, 2p half. Now, the 2p3 level lies above the 2s level, and the energy on the wavelength of the energy uh, separating the two levels is 3 centimeters. Right? Now, it's known that if you scatter Lyman alpha, if you absorb Lyman alpha, you can only go to the 2p state. So if you have an optically thick medium where Lyman alpha photons scatter many, many times, you can very efficiently, um, well, you can efficiently overpopulate the 2p level compared to the 2s level. Now, if you have an overpopulation of atoms in, an, in, in a state with a higher energy compared to a lower energy, you have a population inversion, you shoot radiation through that transition, you get stimulated emission. Right? Now, this is something that has been known for well, 60 years, 55 years. This is a paper by George Field and, and Partridge in 1961, uh, where they were looking actually at this effect in, in, in nearby H2 regions. The, the reason we don't see this effect there is that Lyman alpha doesn't scatter nearly as frequently as it, as it should to work. However, for direct collapse, it may be completely different. So I'll just list some of the conditions. You have isothermal collapse at 10 to the 4 Kelvin, pristine gas, free of H2. These are the main conditions for direct collapse. 10 to the 4 Kelvin, you produce Lyman alpha through collisional excitation. 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas is neutral, so you can actually trap the Lyman alpha efficiently. And the usual um, eliminators of Lyman alpha dust in the low reach of universe, they're absent. Molecular hydrogen is also absent. It was realized already 25 years ago that molecular hydrogen has transitions close to the Lyman alpha resonance. So if you have a, even a tiny bit of molecular hydrogen, it will limit how much Lyman alpha scatters. Right? But molecular hydrogen is gone in these direct collapse black hole scenarios, so you can actually really maximize Lyman alpha scattering, so absolutely maximize Lyman alpha pumping, I think, in any astrophysical environment that I'm aware of, at least. So these conditions are ideal for Lyman alpha pumping. So the scenario we have in mind is this. You have a gas cloud collapsing, right? CMB photons passing through it, the Lyman alpha is pumping the 2p level, so you get stimulated emission of this 3 centimeter emission. Now, how strong can this be? Well, we don't, we don't really know yet, but we, we started with some simplified estimates. This is tau versus mean number density of the cloud. Tau goes up to minus 40, right? So minus 40. Just to stress, the CMB gets amplified by a factor of e to the 40 naively, right? So that will be if the CMB will be amplified by a factor of 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13. This is ridiculous, right? Um, it doesn't, fortunately, well, not fortunately, it actually doesn't amplify the CMB by a factor of 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13. It turns out the maser saturates, the CMB starts affecting the level population itself, and you get a maximum amplification of about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. Right, so that's still a pretty strong maser. So what does it mean? You can calculate the total line flux, which is relevant. So you get a super bright source, right? This is a million Kelvin source, surface brightness uh, in the radio but it's tiny. Right? So if you want to calculate the flux, you need to know the surface brightness times the solid angle. Now these clouds are, of course, very small, so you get a small flux still. But the interesting thing is that, in principle, this flux is not far off, or it's actually within reach in optimistic scenarios of what you could do with SKA1 mid. Right? Now, of course, um, what we show here is that the signal is actually only that luminous over a limited time during the collapse of the cloud. But the fact that it is detectable at all, that you could have line detection of a uh, pristine collapsing cloud at these redshifts, to me, was very exciting. Right? So how would you recognize this? As people always ask me, OK, you detect a line in the radio. How do you know what it is? Well, the three centimeter line has known to have hyperfine structure in it, which makes the line very weird. It is very broad and asymmetric. 
There's three different components to it with different line strength, which give rise to a very distinct asymmetric line shape, which is very broad. It's of the order of, in terms of velocity, would be uh, ten thousands of kilometers per second. Right? So this is something that will be completely different than ordinary recombination lines. So I have about eight seconds left, and I'll leave my conclusions here, and I'll take questions after two seconds. Thanks. Questions? Then, well. This, this three, centimeter, um, three centimeter emission as a smoking gun is really interesting. Can you imagine any scenarios that would prevent us from seeing it while still having a DCBH? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the, one of the main difficulties we have is that this maser is very close to being uh, saturated, right? Or it is saturated. Um, if you, for example, if you have saturated masers, they turn out to be highly beamed, right? So it turns out that the, 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 the stimulated emission is beamed along the direction of the longest axis, basically, of the collapsing cloud. Right? So you can imagine that if the, the radiation is beamed, highly beamed, uh, in, a, in a direction that is, you know, sort of... Uh, we could sort of miss a significant. We could miss basically the largest flux because of this beaming. So it would be the flux would be less than that. Yeah, we face the same problems with radio emission from Sorry? this object. We face the same problems with radio emission from this black hole. Why is that? Well, if um, if uh, there's a black hole and there's a jet and it's driven into the IGM, CMB muting may kill the radio emission from that from the lobes unless the jet's aligned right at you. Right. So if if we looked at if we looked at um, CR7 in the radio and didn't see radio emission, it's not evidence of absence right, of black right, hole. Right, right, right. But presumably, like, this is a line s s shape, right? So in principle, I would expect like, a, a line signature would not be erased just like that. I mean, it would suppress the continuum plus a line in the same way, right? But it is a problem, I think, the, the beaming. But that's something we have to look at. And we are, are going to, actually. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, did I miss this, or you haven't discussed the redshift of this three centimeter line? So <laughs> no, you I mean, didn't. Well, yeah. Basically, you're talking about the 21 centimeter line, right? Which is 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 here. It's the same uh, thing, isn't it? No, no. Sorry. Um, um, so the three centimeters in the rest frame. So the 21 centimeters. I know. I know because it's the difference. Yeah. But but the third, the three centimeter and the 27 centimeter, that's essentially the 21 centimeter line. Um, now these are really different lines, right? Uh, I, I know, but th the transition between those two, uh, in, in, in our current universe, that would correspond to the... Okay, so the calculations on flux that I showed you were for a redshift 10 galaxy. So I redshifted, um, I redshifted the, the frequency to the observer's frame, right? So this will be, this will be 33 centimeters observer's frame. Yeah. Yeah, I should have made that more clear. Well, I mean, the line shape is completely different, right? This is a, a 10,000 kilometers per second asymmetric line. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, here. About three centimeter meter line, uh, can you see the signature during the collapse or uh, even after the formation of supermassive star? So that's a cool thing. Uh, in principle, like the signature is there, um, like the, the signature is there actually before you form the, the black hole. So it's actually, it's, it's, you know, if you look at the optical depth, well, you know, the, the black line actually has no black hole in it. It's just a gas cloud collapsing and you need a heat source. So in this case, it's the gravitational collapse itself that is powering the, the well, is heating the gas basically to about eight, seven, eight thousand Kelvin. I think very consistent with uh, calculations that other people have done. Um, the problem is, um, what was the problem? Let's see. Well, yeah, the flux. The flux is a bit lower, and I actually have to go back and I have to, I have to look into the details. I think the problem was that um, uh, the total flux is a bit lower, as this plot shows you here, right? So the, the red line is the, the case that I showed you earlier. But actually, that doesn't really seem to fit in with the previous slot. So I probably have a, a bug on this particular slide. But it is, you know, the interesting thing is you don't need the black hole to be there to see this. Yeah, thanks. We have time for half a question. 
Yes, Sassani. How certain is the detection of helium-2-1640? I'm just wondering whether you could, this could, the emission could be helium-2 Lyman alpha. What do you mean, Dan? I'm wondering about the redshift. Uh, if you, uh, if it really is at, um, uh, at redshift 6.6 .6 or whatever, then uh, you should see helium-2-1640. Ah. Uh, and I'm wondering how well that is determined. If, it, uh, if, if you don't really see it, it could also be uh, a, a, you could be seeing a helium-2 uh, Lyman alpha at 303 angstroms redshifted up to redshift. Uh. Well, I mean, we have both Lyman alpha and helium-1640 here, right? For the same galaxy, we see both, well, we, they, they well, yeah, they see both lines and the Lyman break. So I think the, the redshift of the object is, uh, is, is well determined, yeah. Okay, let's thank Marco for time.